He says the law of the Lord converts the soul. The word Lord there is Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh. Now here's what you need to understand. Up until now, the first six verses, he's been using the word El for God. He's been, when he's described the physical universe, he's been using the word El. That's the more general word for God, creator God. That's God, the creator, who made the heavens, who made the earth, who made the physical world, who made us. That's El. But now, when he goes into the more specific revelation of the word, he switches to the word Yahweh. Yahweh is covenant God. Promise-making, promise-keeping God. Yahweh is the personal name for God. So if, as he talked about the heavens and the firmament and the physical universe declaring the glory of God, he was saying how it speaks of the Creator. It, but, but God was still far off from us. But now as he shifts to the word that converts the soul, the revelation of God that we get is God is Yahweh. God is promise-maker, promise-keeper, covenant God who will keep His promise you know, to a, a thousand generations, beyond a thousand generations, forever and ever, God will keep His promise. And in the second half of this psalm, He uses Yahweh seven times. Never does He use the word El in the second half. El is Creator God, but Yahweh is the God who wants to be known as Creator God. He wants to be known as our, our Lord and Savior. Okay, so we, we've gone through two words so far, verse number seven. Okay, we've got the law of the Lord, the Torah of the Lord, uh, and we've gotten through the Lord, which is uh, a shift to Yahweh from El, that God wants to personally reveal Himself to us. He wants us to know Him as covenant keeper, promise maker. Then He says that the Torah of Yahweh is perfect. Okay, this word perfect, again, it's just like holding up the diamond. The word perfect carries the idea of both entirety but also full integrity. Okay, so the, the teaching of Yahweh is full of integrity in all of its entirety. That's exactly what he said. That's pretty deep stuff right there. That one statement was worth your price of admission. The Word of God, let me say that again. The Word of God, the, the teaching of Yahweh, the promised covenant-keeping God, the teaching of Yahweh is perfect. It's full of of integrity in its entirety. Okay, that's how God wants to reveal Himself to us. Now let's look at several facets of this diamond. The word, this is all under the word perfect. I told you this was a loaded psalm. This is all under the word perfect. First of all, it's morally perfect. The teaching of the Lord, the teaching of Yahweh is morally perfect. In other words, it's never self-seeking. I'm going to tell you the best among us are always self-seeking sometimes. And no matter how much I love my wife, I'm self-seeking sometimes, and she's self-seeking sometimes, and you're self-seeking sometimes. No matter how much you love your kids, you're self-seeking with them sometimes, and they're self-seeking with you sometimes. But one of the, the powerful aspects of perfect that converts the soul is the revelation that God is never self-seeking in His Word. You know, uh, there, there's no book that you'll pick up. There's no poem. There's no writing that you'll pick up that is not in some aspect self-seeking, except for this one. You pick it up, everything in it's written for your benefit and for mine. There's not one single self-seeking aspect of this book. When it says, thou shalt not kill, it's not because God's seeking something. It's because he's trying to give you something. When it says don't commit adultery, it's not because God's trying to take something from you. It's because God's trying to give something to you. David says, David says the teaching of Yahweh, promise-making, covenant-keeping God, is, is perfect in that it's never self-seeking. It's always got your best interest in mind. You'll never find another person or another writing like that. Now, we're still under the word perfect. <laughs> it's inherently perfect. This is carried with the same word. It's inherently perfect. What that means is that in the form that God originally gave it to us, it was perfect. In the form that God received... Now, I get it that there could be a scribe somewhere down the line that wants to alter a little bit. You know, There may be a new modern translation that comes out that they want to make it new, gender neutral or you know something. But in the form that God gave it to us, in the, in the original form that God gave it to those that He breathed the Scripture into, it was... Perfect. It was inerrant. It was without error. It communicated exactly what God wanted to communicate. Now, that's powerful. Because I don't care if we sit down face to face and eat dinner, there's going to be miscommunication sometimes. But in, in the way that God moved through the original writers, the prophets, 
And, and the writers of Scripture, when He gave the Word to them, it came through inerrantly perfect. It was without error. He communicated exactly what He wanted to communicate to them through the Word. It's all in this word perfect. And this word perfect, it also carries with it the idea of inspired perfect. Now, we sometimes look, you know, maybe you've wrote a poem that you thought was inspired, but it's not inspired like this. This book is inspired. It's God-breathed. It's perfect in the fact that it came from God. It didn't come from a man. We may see personalities to a certain degree. You know, in Peter's writings, you might see Peter's personality coming out a little bit. David, you're going to see David's personality coming out a little bit. But the perfection of the Word is untainted, no matter who the vessel is that God used. That's another one of the incredible things. Like I mentioned in the beginning, approximately 40 different writers over 1,500 years, God used to compose this, this book. And yet, in the spite of their different personalities, the Word came forth with inspired perfection. God still communicated exactly what He wanted to communicate to humanity and to you and me personally through this book in spite of the personality of the person. Now, I know there's a lot of people that, you know, you, you may not be able to get past their personality, okay? I know that I've had people like that in my life. I don't mind admitting it, you know, that they can't get past my personality. To, to, and I'm like, if you would just get past my personality, I have some revelation to give you. I have a gift. To, and then, you know, same way, both ways, both ways around. There have been more than one time, I'll be careful, but there have been more than one time where, um, I might want to share that, because, you know what, you're going to, it's not anyone that's here, but you're going to figure out who it is if I share that story, so I'm not even going to share it. Uh, it's, it's not about anyone that's here, but I feel like it wouldn't work to the greater good to share that story. But many times we've got to get past the personality to get to the treasure. Okay? That's why, you know, again, I'm, I'm drawing a moral equivalent here that's, that will fail. It's not acceptable, really. But, but, you know, people can't get past the personality of our president. And I'm like, I don't care. His personality, look what he's doing. You know, he, he's... And, and one person in particular always likes to say, well, he's just pandering to his base. Well, if appointing conservative judges and moving the capital, uh, supporting the move of the capital to Jerusalem and all of these, you know, defunding 900 Planned Parenthoods, if, if that's pandering to the base, then I'll accept that. I don't care if he's pandering to the base. It's not whether he's pandering to the base or not. It's what he's doing. Do you see that? You've got to get past the personality to the what, what he's actually doing. Uh, whether you like the personality or not doesn't matter. But that's, you know, that, that like I said, the illustration fails in comparison. But that's what's incredible about the Word of God, is that in spite of the personality, the truth that God gave through the person was still inherently inspired. And that portion of it that He communicated through them to us was without error. Now, we know for a fact that the Apostle Paul, for instance, had many other writings. He had many other letters that were circulated among the churches. And there's a good possibility that in time, parts of those will surface. But you know what? That doesn't mean that they're equivalent to Scripture. Because, but the parts of Scripture that God breathed through Paul that were inspired, and it's another subject of how we compose the book, definitely not going to tackle that one today. But those parts of Scripture that were inspired got through the Apostle Paul's personality to be inherently perfect in their presentation. That's supernatural in of itself. And these are all aspects. Now, you've got to stick with me for one more. This is all under the word perfect. And it can all be found in this one word in Psalm 19. Okay, the, 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 the law of the Lord, the Torah of Yahweh is perfect. It's morally perfect. It has your best interest. It's inherently perfect. It's inspired perfect. Now listen, here's a big one. And, and I think we need to hear this one. It means that it's sufficiently perfect. The Word of God is sufficiently perfect. What does that mean? Well, let me uh, give you a cross-reference to bring out what, what King David is saying here. 2 Peter 1.3 says that as God's divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. He says He's given us all things that pertain to life 
to life and godliness. Some people, they'll approach this book and they'll say, that's a good spiritual tradition. You know, if, as long as you keep it inside the church and if you're talking about your religious life, then I don't have any problem with the Bible. But if you start trying to make that Bible stuff apply to politics, if you try to make it apply to science, if you try to make it apply to the education system, we've got a problem. No, you've got a problem. Because this word is perfect in the sense that it's sufficiently perfect. What God gave us is so inspired in the Word of God that it can speak to science. It can speak to politics. It can speak to the education system. And it should do so. Okay? It's my goal that my politics don't, don't dictate my religion, if you want to use that word, but my religion does dictate my politics. That's why I don't care how good you may think certain economic policies are, I'm not going to kill, vote for a baby killer. It's just not going to happen. It's a deal breaker. Deal's off. Oh, but there's such a good personality and everyone's got hang-ups. You're killing babies, it's a deal breaker. Yeah. Alright? I'm just telling you. My religion colors my politics. I'm not going to lie about that. Now, you know, if we're talking about an individual sitting in my office crying and I'm counseling them, I'm going to act in love. But if we're talking about a political party and a, and a cultural revolution and things that are impacting millions of lives here, it's a deal breaker for me. You kill babies, you're off the table. I don't care if you're Republican or if you're not Republican or if you're Democrat or if you're independent. You kill babies, you don't get my vote. I'll skip that box if I know that. If I know that you kill babies, I'll skip that box when I vote. Because I can't vote no, so I have to skip it. Alright? <laughs> because it does. It colors my politics. It colors my life. David says the Word of God... Okay, we could actually read it this way. The law of the Lord or the teaching of Yahweh is sufficiently perfect for your life. That means if, if you'll get in this book, what if you look and if you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, you'll get what you need for your spiritual life. You'll get what you need for your marriage. You'll get what you need for your finances. You'll get what you need for your education. This book will supply it. Now, uh, I came across uh, uh, a teaching by a man named, uh, some of you might have heard his name. It's not a real common name, but Bob Hoekstra. And if you've ever done any studies in Christian counseling, you've probably heard the name. He's a very well-known, respected Christian counselor. And I came across a, a quote that I just love. Listen to what he said. Bob Hoekstra, this is a Christian counselor. Then I'll set it in context for you. The attack on the Word of God in the church today is not on its inspiration. Most Christians believe that. But the attack is on its sufficient, uh, sufficiency. The Word of God is still enough. Now let me read that again. The attack on the Word of God in the church today is not on its inspiration. Most Christians believe that. It is on its sufficiency, but the Word of God is still enough. Okay, this is a Christian counselor, a very well-known, respected author and Christian counselor uh, in, in, in that circle, those circles. And the context of this is he's talking about the problem that he faces in biblical counseling and in Christian counseling is that counselors think that they got to add to the Word of God to counsel people. For instance, he uses the example of, well, okay, we can get some good things out of, of here, but there are things that Freud covered that the Bible didn't cover. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, these are Christian counselors we're talking about. Generally, and, and it, it's an epidemic, it, 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 it's a pandemic among Christian counselors that you'll come in for marriage counseling. Well, let's just be, we're all grown ups here, you know, pastor or counselor. The two might be the one, but Christian, we're talking, understand we're talking Christian counseling right now. Pastor or counselor, I need to talk to you about my sex life. What does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible says some things, but I really appreciate Sigmund Freud's work on human sexuality. And, you know, we have to throw out a lot of Freud, but Freud definitely had some truth in him. And so we want to present, we want to help you with some of the truth. Well, okay, wait, wait, whether or not Freud had some truth in him, the whole worldview and the mindset of Freud or, 
or Darwin or you know whoever else you want to. The whole mindset is anti-Christ and anti-Christian, and the war in the church today is against the sufficiency of the word. And what he's saying, as one of the top Christian counselors, thank God that he's there as one of the top Christian counselors in the nation. He's saying, and I'm not putting words in his mouth now. I'm using these particular words, but he's saying there's a pandemic. You don't have to introduce all this crap from other sources. The Word of God is sufficient. If you'll do your homework, if you'll ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, anything you need to counsel a person is in here. Yes. Amen. Yeah, and I think he's right. Because I think that, uh, and now don't raise your hand, but I think that if we went around to people, and sometimes it's very subtle, because, yeah, there's truth outside the Word of God. Of course there is, you know. Uh, they, you know, the way that my car burns gasoline is based upon truth. If it wasn't based upon truth, then it wouldn't burn the gasoline. It wouldn't work, right? There's a truth to that. But what he's saying is that we don't have to introduce all of these outside things. The Word is sufficient. And actually, the word perfect here, that's exactly... Remember the diamond, the different facets of the diamond? That's exactly what the word meant that David was using. He says, the law of the Lord is sufficiently perfect to convert the soul. Now wait, this, I told you this thing is deep. Remember what the word soul means. Mind, will, and emotions. My mind, my will, my emotions. Now he's not just talking about, you know, co about cosmic salvation in the sense of I believe on Jesus, you know, I receive salvation. David is talking about converting of the way we think, the way we feel. How many of you know that the way we feel isn't always right even though we feel it? How many of you know that the way we think isn't always right, even though we think it? I didn't say it wasn't real. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Did I say it wasn't real? I didn't mean to say it, but I, it's not right. Okay, good. I didn't twist words. The way we feel isn't always right, even if it's real. The way we think is real, but it's not always right. David says, the law of the Lord. And it's this is such a powerful psalm. Because again, he introduces the intimacy of God into this. He goes from the creator God down to the promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God who wants to reveal himself to us. He says the teachings of Yahweh are sufficiently perfect to convert your soul. Yeah. They'll speak to every circumstance and every situation you could ever face in life. Yeah. It never goes out of style. It never goes out of date. It's always there. You don't need to introduce outside sources of inspiration in order to find what you need. Now, there is a real war on this. Now, there, there's a little nuance here. Here's the thing. Uh, God, help me have the grace to communicate this. If I make this statement, it is true what I'm about to say, because I'm not setting up for failure. The statement I'm about to make is true. The Bible does not tell us everything. Now, Pastor, you just contradicted yourself. No, listen to what I'm telling you. The Bible does not tell us everything. You know why it doesn't tell us everything? The Bible itself tells us it doesn't tell us everything. It said uh, in the end of the book of John that if all that Jesus said and did were to be recorded, all the books in the entire world couldn't contain it. Right. The Bible itself tells us that it doesn't tell us everything. Yes. yes, there are things that the Bible doesn't tell us. But when David here is teaching us good doctrine, that the Word of God is sufficiently perfect to meet your every need. He's not saying there are things the Bible won't tell you. Sure, there are those things the Bible won't tell you. But he's telling you that whatever you need to know, the Bible tells you. Yes. Yeah. Whatever you need to know, the Bible tells you. Yeah. Uh, and Jesus revealed to us everything that we need to know. Very specifically. And he goes down through these many facets of the diamond. I mean, we're just on the first one. <laughs> the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. We haven't even gotten to the second half of the verse yet. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's sufficiently perfect. The war is always on the word. Be close-minded. Be big-headed. Say if it's not in the word, I'm not going to believe it. Say that when I need something from God, I'm going to go to the word to find it from God. It's not that we don't acknowledge that there are other sources of information, but we're just saying that what I need is going to be found in this book. And if there's a conflict between that and this, it's going to go with this. And, you know, it's like the old the old story. You've heard it before. I know it's so graphic, but you've heard it before. Would you like a brownie? Oh, I would love a brownie. Okay, I didn't wash my hands after I used the bathroom. Brownies don't taste so good anymore, do they? 
What, what are the chance? There's very little chance that you're going to get any sickness out of that, but you might. And you don't eat the brownie if I didn't wash my hands after I used the bathroom, do you? If you know that, you'll put the brownie down. I think I'll pass today. Yeah. Why? Because in all the goodness that you're getting, there's strong potential that what's going to get introduced to you is something not so good. See, the church, and I'm telling you, that there's a lot of good churches, a lot of good pastors. We all, you know, one of the things that's going to tell us is, as we ever, if we ever get down to this verse, is it's going to tell us that, that God's teaching brings us back on course. That's one of the things He's going to teach us because we all drift sometimes, and he, we all do, 100% of us. And God's teachings bring us back on course. He's going to teach us that as we go. But we don't need to introduce all this other junk, all this other crap from outside because the Word of God itself is sufficient to meet our every need. When there's a conflict between that and this, it's going to be this. Even if I cannot explain it at this time, it's going to be this. And I'm pretty sure that if I will ask the Lord and if I will take time to do, do the legwork to look in this, as well as praying and asking for leadership, that there's probably, I'm pretty sure, 100% of the time that I'm going to find my answer. Sometimes I might have to wait, it might take a little while, might have to meditate, might have to cross-reference, might have to study, might even have to break open an old dusty commentary every now and then. But I'm going to find my answer in the Word. The Word of God. You say, why are you spending the whole message pounding away on this? Because this is where the Word is at in the church. And I believe what this Christian counselor has said. I believe that it's true. Because if I go through every church in this town, in this county, and if I say it's the Word of God inspired, I almost guarantee 100% of them would say yes. Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Baptist. Yes, it's an inspired word of God. But if I said, is the word of God 100% sufficient? You'd get a little pause. Well, there may be a few things the word of God don't quite. What does it say about building a border wall? What does it say about Black Lives Matter? What does it say about COVID-19? The word of God will address every one of these issues. Whether, whether contemporary or not contemporary. The Word of God will address that. It will be sufficient to do it. It's not that we have to put blinders on to the other stuff that's out there, but we're just saying the Word of God is sufficient, and I'm going to be thoroughly involved in this before I consider that. You see, we've got to settle the sufficiency of the Word of God. If you will settle... Now, uh, this is not degrading and talking down, because like I said, we all got to be brought back on course of that and want as well. But if you will settle the sufficiency of the Word of God in your heart, you'll praise it. Because you'll, you'll realize everything I need is in it. Why do you think David said it's sweeter than the honeycomb and it's more to be prized than the finest of gold? David was a rich man, wealthy man. But he was said, like, oh, and he put his money where his mouth was. Give me the Word of God. I'll put all that aside for the Word of God because the Word of God holds the treasure to everything both in life and in godliness. Peter said that, in life and in godliness. You ever notice when Peter left, this is a little side note, you ever notice when Peter left his, his nets? When they were full. The nets were full when Peter walked away from them. And he's the same apostle that God wrote through him, the Spirit breathed through him, this word of God will give you everything you need for life and for godliness. These people believed this. This wasn't just some, some colloquialism, some pat answer, some you know, passing by phrase that they were making. The Word of God is sufficient within itself. If God reveals His Word to us, it will, it, it, it will address every single issue in our lives. Whether it be spiritual issues, whether it be physical issues, it will be addressed. Let me tell you, there's a war on that right now. You know what the war is? You're supposed to, if, you, if you believe this whole archaic stuff, you're an apple dragon idiot. That's a so antiquated, so outdated. It doesn't address the modern issues of, of the day. Baloney. Let's finish this verse up, basically. We're close. Don't worry. I'm telling you, every word you can press down into every word of this psalm, and it's all like this. He says that the word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word convert means to repent, return, recover, restore, revive. Just out of the one word uh, in English, we're speaking in English now. The one word convert there, you've got a five-point alliterated sermon out of the one word convert, out of this psalm. The word of God, 
I don't know how much you can get in Hebrew, but out of English, the Word of God is perfect converting the soul. Convert means it'll make your soul repent. It'll make your soul return. It'll make your soul recover. It'll make your soul restore. It'll make your soul revive. Your mind, your will, your emotions. The Word of God will do the right things for it. You need to relax, get in the Word of God. You need to repent, you're going to know that by the Word of God. You need to restore, get in the Word of God. You need to recover, get in the Word of God. You know, uh, now I don't know enough about them to really condemn them, but there's a lot of 12-step recovery programs that would probably be better if you just get into the Word of God. A lot of them do get you into the Word of God, too. That's why they're successful, like Team Challenge and, and so forth. Uh, Psalm 37, 4, David wrote that one, too, I believe, and he said, Delight yourself in the Lord who will give you the desires of your heart. That's exactly what he's talking about. You get into the Word, your desire base changes. Your taste changes. The things you want change. It converts your soul. It changes your taste. You know, I've heard a lot of people say when they had to go off salt, you know, and I'm like, I hope I never have to go off salt by the grace of God. But when people have had to go off salt, they, things taste so bland, but after a while, their taste changes and they like it better without salt and they taste it better without salt. Well, it, it's a failed comparison, but that's what David is saying. He's saying the the word of the Lord is perfect. It'll change the taste buds of your soul. The world will taste different. Your worldview will be changed when you get the Word of God down in you. He says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. <laughs> we got four minutes to do the second half of this verse, and I need four hours for every word. <laughs> the testimony of the Lord is sure. The word testimony there is witness. I wondered, why did he change it up? Why did? Okay, remember it's paralleling. He said law or Torah of the Lord, and now he says, he, he parallels it with testimony. Again, it's another facet in the diamond. The testimony means the witness. The witness. It's the witness that we give and the witness that we receive. The witness of the Lord is sure. Now listen, the word sure means faithful, firm, foundation, enduring. Enduring. Now we talked about this even though I didn't spend the time on it this morning. But the word sure, the, the testimony. When we talk about God and when we hear from God, the revelation we are giving and getting from God is sure. It's a firm foundation. And that word sure means that it's an enduring, lasting foundation. Remember I talked about the enduring word of God? Why do you think this is the only book, really, throughout history that hasn't had to be altered, that hasn't been able to be erased, that the harder they try to suppress it, the more that it... It's because David tells us right in this... This is the testimony of the Lord right here. This is the testimony of his, his glory, his handiwork, what he's created, what he desires to do in us, what he desires to do in, in this earth. And this is the testimony of the Lord. David says it's sure. In other words, one of the ways that modern translations may put it is it's the enduring word of God. One of the aspects that makes this a unique book is it's the enduring word of God. If the world goes on another 2,000 years, the Word of God will endure. There's, I know it's silly. There's this old, oldie song that I like, and it's, I don't agree with the, the lyrics, but I love it. In the year 2525, remember that? In the year, some of you don't know, some of you know what I'm talking about. In the year 3535, I don't even know the words, but it's an oldie from like, like the, the 60s. And we, you know, but I think, like, I think the song gets to, in the year 10,000, it's been 10,000 years, I just heard it on the trip. That's why I'm thinking of it. But but uh, uh, it, when we get to 10,000 years, guess what? The Word of God will still be enduring. That's why he doesn't have to get in a hurry. The Word is the Word. It's a sure foundation. It's an enduring foundation. It's not going to crack up. If the foundation is strong, then the work is going to last. David says the testimony of the Lord is sure. It's the enduring Word of God. It will never give up. And we will close but you got to get the last half of this. It makes wise the simple. All of the stuff. This has been a mouthful. I know it's 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 more than the seed of learning can endure. And we're only getting. We I, I've even failed you this morning. I have failed you this morning to even communicate what this one verse holds in it. Verse number seven. But let me leave you with this. That the testimony of the Lord is sure. It's an enduring foundation that makes wise the symbol. You know why there's such a fight on making you feel like 
Bible-believing Christians are bigots, knuckle-dragging idiots. They haven't woke up. They haven't smelled the coffee. They, they haven't you know, read the latest scientific... You know why? Because this Word of God makes wise the simple. You want to talk about empowerment? You want to talk about being empowered? Get into the Word of God. It, will, it literally, David is saying, will convert your soul. It will make the idiot brilliant. It will make the idiot brilliant. You know, you look at some of the brilliant minds and they'll tell you that their foundation has come from the Word of God. I want to tell you something. People with our president, God bless our president, and I'm glad that God has raised him up through this hour. But I look at, not just this race, I look at the last race with Clinton and Trump, and I look at the presidential race before that, you know, with Obama and who, who was that one? The, the guy on his, Romney? Wasn't it Romney? That was the first one. It was, uh, I forget who was first. No, Romney was before that. And then the one before that was McCain. Well, we look at all these, and you know what the criticism is that I agree with? The bench isn't very deep. I mean, really, it's realistic. The bench isn't very deep. Okay, now work with me. I'm not work with me here. The bench isn't very deep. Okay, you can complain about Trump, but you're putting Biden against him? Are you kidding me? That's not a very deep bench if that's the best you can come up with. And even the whole, I love Trump, but even Trump and Clinton, you know, Trump won as much for people not wanting Clinton as much as he won for being Trump. Let's just be honest about it. Okay, here's Clinton and here's Trump. That's pretty much a no-brainer for a lot of us, okay, at least in this neck of the woods. All right? But, but the bench isn't very deep. The bench is not deep, and it hasn't been deep for years. You look at our senators and our congressmen. Now, let's turn back history a little bit. At the time when you had guys like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. Now, many of those founding fathers were deists, and they had very strongly different Christian views that we have than we have today. Many of them felt like, you know, God set the world in motion and stepped back and just left it to man. God was uninvolved. Many of them were cessationists. They didn't believe in all the miracles and all that. They, they had some very different Christian beliefs than we have today, granted. But you know what was different? Those guys, they grew up on the mama's knee reading this. They stayed up late around the campfire reading this. And the Word of God literally made the simple wise. If, the, if that, if, if, let me tell you something, if, the, if our revolution from Britain were happening in 2020, it wouldn't be happening. But what was different about that day was this was the book, most houses had one book in it. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the, the novels and the science books, and we're not anti-education and anti-novel, but I'm saying this was the book that they had, and they, they memorized these scriptures, and what did David say that the Word of God would do? Convert the soul. And so even if they didn't have all the same beliefs that we have, the foundation was sure, and that, where do you think... Where do you think our legal system came from? People can rant rave all they want that this wasn't a Christian nation. Well, this nation opened all religions, granted. Where do you think our legal codes came from? Our legal system came from? Where do you think what we're looking now, you know, at, at people like we've got to elect, and we're like the benches and deep. But you go back to the old days, you know, days of like guys like Lincoln, you know, and even really even before Lincoln, even though there was slavery and there was a lot of things that we're not proud of, these guys were full of the Word of God, and it made the simple wise. The Word of God gave our founding fathers the wisdom to make one of the most enduring constitutions of all human history. It was the Word of God that did that. And now you come to our day, and you say, why is the bench? Why isn't the bench deeper? Really? I got to choose Trump or Biden? Well, how many years now has the Word of God been out of the school system? And has prayer been out of the school system? And how many years has it been since Grandma sat down bouncing little baby on her knee? And you're surprised that the bench isn't very deep anymore? Friends, we need a fresh revelation of God. That's what this psalm is all about. 
And it's going to take time to rebuild it. It's not going to happen overnight. And we're going to have revival and God is merciful and we're going to have big harvest that's going to happen. America doesn't end this way. I believe with my whole heart that's a word from God. But if you want better options, you better start raising them up. And I'm not just speaking with people here. I know your kids are grown, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. The word of God makes wise the simple. You, if you really believe that this book is sufficient, that God will speak to you, it will meet every need in your family and in your life, then you'll spend time in it, and the Word of God will make wise the simple. 